Exchange-traded funds are much like index mutual funds. That is, they create a portfolio that aims to replicate the returns of a particular benchmark index. The main difference between the two is their method of creation and redemption of shares. Investors buy or sell mutual fund shares at the end of the day directly with the issuer at the closing NAV of the fund for the day. In contrast, investors can trade ETFs with each other like regular stocks on the stock exchange during trading hours. The ETF issuer is not involved in the trading of the shares. If left solely to market forces, periods of demand and supply imbalance can cause the market price of ETF shares to deviate significantly from the NAV of the underlying shares in the portfolio. To address this issue, the ETF issuer designates authorised participants as the market maker. In essence, the APs will buy the ETF shares from some sellers when the supply is higher than demand, and sell the ETF shares from its inventory when demand is higher. At the end of the day, the AP will look at its inventory and decide if it needs more or fewer shares in its inventory to meet the next day's trades. If the AP anticipates higher demand and the existing inventory of ETF shares may not meet the demand, the AP will seek for the creation of new shares from the ETF manager. Each ETF manager will publish a list of underlying securities for the creation of ETF shares. This is known as the creation basket. The ETF issuer will also specify the minimum lot size, known as the creation unit. So, for example, each creation unit entails the creation of 50,000 ETF shares for a specified number of underlying securities in the creation basket. The AP will have to purchase the specified number of underlying securities from the stock market and exchange them for 50,000 ETF shares. The redemption process is the opposite. If the AP feels that it's holding too many ETF shares and there is insufficient cash to meet more supply, the AP may choose to return the excess ETF shares to the issuer. Likewise, the issuer publishes a redemption basket list. This list is usually the same as the creation basket, but it may be different if the ETF issuer is trying to sell particular securities for tax, compliance or investment reasons. Likewise, there is the minimum lot size of 50,000 shares. So, for the redemption of 50,000 ETF shares, the AP receives the basket of securities which it can choose to sell some to raise cash. So, as you can see, the AP balances its inventory of ETF shares, underlying securities and cash according to the anticipated demand and supply of the ETF shares. This arrangement of having an AP in the middle to handle all transactions serves a number of purposes. Firstly, this lowers costs for the ETF issuer as it does not incur any transaction cost in the buying and selling of the underlying securities. All the buying and selling is done by the APs. Secondly, tax efficiency. As mentioned earlier, ETF managers can choose to publish redemption baskets that differ from the creation basket, allowing them to target low basis stocks that will be part of the redemption basket. The remaining holdings of the ETF will be of higher cost basis, thereby minimising the portfolio's unrealised gains, which can potentially minimise capital gains tax. And most importantly, to keep the market price close to the NAV of the ETF. If the market price deviates from the NAV, the AP will step in to earn arbitrage profit. For example, if demand is high and buyers bid at $101 for a share of ETF with $100 NAV, the AP will buy the underlying securities using $100, use the securities to create a new ETF share, and sell it for $101, earning an arbitrage profit of $1. This puts downward pressure on the price of the ETF shares and puts upward pressure on the price of underlying securities. This continues until the market price and NAV are equal, so no further arbitrage opportunity exists. In the opposite case, where supply is high and sellers are willing to sell at $99,
The AP will buy the ETF share for $99, redeem the share for the underlying shares, and sell them at their NAV of $100, earning an arbitrage profit of $1. Likewise, this continues until there is no further arbitrage opportunity. Based on these arguments, the ETF share should trade within a price band around the NAV, known as the arbitrage gap. Minimally, this gap should be wide enough for the AP to recover the costs it incurred in the creation or redemption process. This includes the transaction costs in the purchase and sale of the underlying securities and also pays a service fee to the ETF manager. The liquidity of the underlying shares plays an important role in determining the transaction costs. Illiquid securities have wider bid-ask spreads, which translates to higher transaction costs for the AP. As such, the arbitrage gap for ETFs with illiquid underlying stocks may be wider. Arbitrage gaps can manifest in the form of bid-ask spread on the ETF shares, so it can be seen as the passing of the costs incurred by the AP to the transacting shareholders. The NAV of the ETF is not affected by the transaction costs. This arrangement is fairer to non-transacting shareholders, as the value of their holdings are not impacted by transaction costs. Shareholders who trade frequently incur more transaction costs, while those who buy and hold incur less costs. In contrast, mutual funds deduct transaction costs from the NAV, so all shareholders bear this cost regardless of how frequently they trade. You're watching an excerpt from our comprehensive animation library. For more videos like these, head on down to prepnuggets.com. At Prep Nuggets, let us do the hard work for you.